Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This episode 135. Today's guest is an actor, comedian, and director. He's an alum of the famed Groundlings Theater. You know him from Showgirls, Ellen, Mad About You, Family Guy, Curb You Enthusiasm, The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. And of course, he played Ethan, the title character in the season seven episode of Seinfeld, The Wig Master. Please welcome Patrick Bristow. Patrick, thanks for joining. Thank you, Tony. Hi, Chris. Hey, Patrick. Welcome to this podcast to make me thirsty. We could not be more excited. So take us back, Patrick, 26 years ago, believe it or not. Oh, the I wig master who, the wig master aired on nbc you were of course the wig master susan's friend but tell us a little bit obviously you had history with the groundlings and such a great career but um in 96 so tell us a little bit how the the role of ethan came about was it a uh, an audition process did you know someone from the show tell us a little bit how how that role came about um i auditioned for it and um i think some of the writers uh at the time uh, were aware of me through Groundlings or Ellen, which I had done a season of at that point. And, um, or maybe they were Showgirls fan. No, that hadn't come out yet. Never mind. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just an audition process. And, and in terms of how the role came about itself, again, um, the, one of the writers, and I'm sorry, I should have done my research to remember, uh, actually had a yeah, friend of Spice. Wife. Stay with them. Okay, there you go. Yeah, Spike Ferriston. Yeah, yeah. Did he tell you, you about yeah. that? Did he uh, kind of fill you in on that? The, the, the yes. real story? Yeah. Oh, cool. How did yeah. that go? I, um, I mean, he just told me based that it was, that he had had this experience. He didn't get into much detail about okay. it. Sorry, I don't have the story. No, no, oh, that's fine. we're up to an auspicious start. <laughs> but uh, but but Patrick, you're right. Showgirls actually was the year before, so someone might have liked that episode. That, oh, that okay. Movie. All right. Sure. It all blurs. Um, together. Yeah, you know, the mid-90s, it get, yeah, it all jumbled together. Even so, when it was happening. Yeah. Even when, exactly. So what do you, like, um, tell us a little, was Larry David um, at the audition? Like, tell us a little about what kind of, what lines you did for audition that actually made the show, or what do you remember about the audition specifically? I don't remember any kind of, of the lines from the audition changing to shooting script hmm. um, at all. Um, I mean, I, I could be wrong if somebody's got, you know, all the drafts of the script, all the different colored pages, but I, I don't remember having to learn anything new, um, which I think I, I normally I'd remember that. Um, and uh, yes, I think Larry was uh, at the audition. It was just a few people in, a, in an office at CBS Radford out in the Valley here in LA. And, um, you know, I mean, it was definitely a fun part. I knew immediately that I, I'd like this kind of like clueless um socially awkward happy person right um you know there's a little bit of me in that um and uh so yeah i connected to the role immediately yeah I mean, and i agreed with i agreed with him like you know he um he liked fluffy bangs he didn't like um straight bangs i don't remember if that <laughs> line got into the I don't know if it did. I, I, I don't we, think it did. I, I okay, watched so it again have... today just to just to uh, just to refresh, but I don't remember it. Is that talking to um, Elaine or? I think that was actually talking to George of all people. I think I was combing a wig on the couch. I was like, I like fluffy bangs. I don't like straight bangs. You know, <laughs> and like he was, you know, like sharing that. Like George gave it crap. Right, um, right. So there, I think I, I think we've discovered a line that might have gotten cut. There you go. And and to that point, I think your opening, I think it's your opening scene. And it's it's really, I think, the line that defines your character from then on in the rest of the episode is just when you give that sort of impersonation of George when when uh, you ask him how his day was and then and then Susan comes in and she asks him how his day was. You're like, I asked him, he said, Good day, good day. And you did like a little like impersonation. I think that kind of captured that what you're talking about there. Like George really doesn't watch you around, but you're just like this happy go lucky guy. who's just like, yeah. you know, oh, good day. Good day. It's such a great little scene there. I know uh, you had, you had a few with, with Jason Alexander. Maybe you could, you could kind of touch on, if not that scene, just kind of working with, with Jason and how that was on, on set. Well, first off the delivery of the line that you just said, um, I was not up on, you know, um, the traditions and tropes of Seinfeld. And so, oh, um, and so the writer of the episode had taken me aside and say, this is kind of a callback. You need to do it this way. And um, the other thing was Jason wasn't there during most of the, I think any of the rehearsals, now that I think of it, um, 
or he wasn't there at, at, toward the end of it. Sorry, that was my alarm to like tell me to be here seven minutes late, whatever. Um, long story short, I didn't have the um, the resource, the original to, to make fun of. Um, and so the writer could take me aside and kind of spoon feed it to me. He goes, it's like this, it's in this rhythm. It has to be in this rhythm. I'm like, okay, all right, all right, got it. Because I had just read it like any other line and they were like, nope, 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 nope. So, um, yeah, that was one of those things where I was doing something that I didn't really understand, which can often be the case. But um, in, in that situation, it was definitely the case. And I just I just took my direction. Right. Um, as, yeah, go ahead. Oh, just, you go ahead. Go ahead. But Jason. Well, you know, um, his wife was expecting that week. And I think she actually had her baby the day before we shot the scenes uh, that were in the apartment in front oh, of wow. the audience. I shot the other stuff um, out without an audience out um, on the uh, the back lot at Bradford. But um, yeah, so, um, yeah, and, and he was, I think, in just like the euphoria of just having a child. So we met and he was just kind of like, hi, yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was he was on his own wavelength. That's interesting. That's a really good story, though, actually. <clears throat> well, it helped in a way because we had no we had zero connection. <laughs> yeah, it helped the character. <laughs> You know, there was, there was really nothing, nothing there for us to either work with or against, you know. It's... So you mentioned um, you didn't know too much about the show. I mean, this was season seven at this point. I know. And, you know, no, no. And of interest. So Michael McDonald, he's also a, a Groundlings alum. I think yep. Seinfeld just Seinfeld has a ton of Groundlings alums. Huh. Obviously. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, That's you guys know funny. Jennifer Coolidge, Heather Morgan. I mean, you name it, they've been in there. You, Yeah, you can go on and on. So I'm, I'm assuming you spoke to some of them maybe prior to, to joining the show or how quickly did you know you got the part and you kind of jumped right into it? Um, I, I think it was pretty much kind of like, a, oh, you're working next week kind of deal. And it, um, yeah. So it was, you know, it was a pretty fast turnaround. Typically you'd audition for a guest star early midweek and then find out later that week that you booked it. And then, you know, Monday morning, you're at the table read. Um, in terms of, you know, friends who'd done the show, yeah, I had known people who'd done the show, but I wasn't like, I, I wasn't asking like, like, what's it like or anything like that. I, I'd done a lot of multicams at that point. And of course, Seinfeld was the multicam. But um, yeah, I didn't go in, you know, uh, like I needed to scope it out or nervous or any, anything along those lines. Yeah. I mean, that that's sometimes you want to just go in fresh. Right. Um, you know, it's yeah. interesting. Um, you know, season seven was, was Larry David's last, last season uh, at the helm, um, at Seinfeld, you know, he left right after that. And, and obviously you show up later on down the road and curb, uh, yeah. as the, as the choreographer in some, in some great episodes with, with Ben Stiller and David Schremer and just, yeah. you know, some, some great, great episodes. Um, you know, even Patrick Kerr, who's the piano player, he was in Seinfeld as well. Love him. Um, yeah. So just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on, on, on that experience. Kind of did Larry bring you in from, from Seinfeld or did you just audition with your Groundlings experience and how did the whole curb episodes come about? And what was that like kind of shooting those, those iconic, uh, shows? Well, um, you know, I auditioned, you know, with a handful of other uh, um, actors, especially with improv background, because they use that on Curb. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, I got it. That one actually was closer to the wire. I think I was not first choice. There might have been someone else and then they weren't available or something like that. But anyway, it came kind of just I'm like, oh, you got it. I'm like, what? When? And they're like, you know, now almost. Um, but uh, I hadn't really uh, interacted with uh, Larry on Seinfeld. And of course I did a lot on, on Curb. So, um, you know, I knew his uh, reputation for being kind of blunt, you know, and uh, this was definitely a show going into where friends who had done it, I'd asked, you know, like, okay, what, right. what's going on here? Right. Um, the audition itself, they gave it, they gave me a scenario and said you're going to improvise i think with the casting director probably and um you know and and just make up stuff within the scenario they gave me it was like you're you're this guy this is what's going on and your goal here is to humiliate larry or whatever right or scare him or you know right. make him think he got in over his head so they give you those kind of outlines which for an improviser is wonderful 
the, you know, the, the, the burden of the storytelling is you just have to do that beat. They've already figured out all these beats and how they go together. And so it gives you a context and it's really fun. It's kind of my favorite way of improvising, frankly. Um, and, uh, you know, I felt pretty good about the audition. Like I said, I got the, the job much, uh, I think pretty close to when I was shooting it, if I recall correctly. And the weird thing was, is that I was supposed to be the choreographer of the producers. Well, I hadn't right. seen the producers. It hadn't been in LA. I couldn't find anything, any sources. And I'm, and I'm supposed to be teaching them a, a, a choreography routine. So I'm like, you know, I, I'd been a lousy dancer back in my musical theater days. So I just went, okay, well, let's try this, you know? And I go, this seems like it could fit in the producers. <laughs> and I felt almost like, like, oh my God, I feel like I need to apologize to the actual choreographer. Like I need to send them flowers or something right. like so you making making your... all that up on the fly, like the dance moves with your feet and everything that you were doing. You were just like, let me just do, throw some, some, some stuff out there when you were like showing Larry, like how to do the tap dance and everything. I was supposed to show him something that was too fast. Yeah. And all I could think was, you know, and I'd seen him kind of attempt some stuff and I was like, okay, he's a disaster and a delicious. <laughs> I'm not going to have any problem here, but I need to do something that makes me look slightly credible, even in the world of, you know, TV comedy. So I just did a pod beret over and over and over and over. And it, it looks like it's, you know, something that's nothing. Um, but of course he's, he's making it too big. So he's like a giraffe on ice. <laughs> so you totally, you totally fooled us. I thought yeah, you were like, that's what I'm saying. It looked like you were a I'm trained gonna... dancer. You were unbelievable. The background was. I am um, uh, my uh, my mom was a ballet teacher. I I did do my time at the bar, Maybe but I, I was not you know. And my my first jobs, I think I was a professional dancer in a in a professional company of a um, fiddler on the roof. Yes. So yeah, I have a background, but like my like my musical theater stuff, it's all only used for comedy. After my twenties, it was like, all right, I can sing with vibrato, so I'll make fun of that, as opposed to really competing with the people that can really, you know, really nail those things. Uh-uh. Right. But um, those skills have come in really handy in improv. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you have to uh, know. You, you, oh, sorry. And you could tell the um, kind of the chemistry you have with Larry, just like you two walking down the street. I mean, it was – that had to be pretty fun, right? I mean, especially episode two, the um, – The five wood. <laughs> The one uh, was that the one where we were walking on the street to, to go to like yeah, a yeah. mini art on break and we got yeah. nuts. Yeah. Yes. yes. Nuts and raisins. raisins. Yeah. You said fierce yeah. like all the time. Every other word. <laughs> yeah. And and OK, here's an example of, of Larry's bluntness, which I personally I love. I love that New York. Like, I'm just going to say what I mean, you know, and, and I remember some people actually on the set were just kind of like, you know, like, oh, my God, I think he hates me. And just like, shut up. It, I think you'd know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd know. Yeah, I, I, it's his show, um, you know, and I, I found him refreshing and, 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 and funny. Um, but when we were doing that thing where we were crossing the street, I think it's just an establishing shot now. Maybe I say fierce in it. But again, just like that thing on Seinfeld where they had to coach me how to say something, he goes, I, I need you to, I don't know if he'd own this now, it'd be politically incorrect. He'd fucking own it. Of course he would. Um, uh, but uh, he said, he go, goes, yeah, you need to be uh, you need to be gayer. And I'm like, what? And he's and I wasn't offended. I was just surprised because <laughs> nobody had ever said that to me. Right. You know, I was like, I think I got that covered. Um, but he goes, he goes, yeah, I almost didn't cast you because of that. And I was like. Really? Yeah. And he's telling me this right before we're shooting, you know. So I'm like, OK, all right. You know, um, I I'll 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 fierce it up. <laughs> you know, God knows I had, you know, uh, enough uh, history in the 80s of doing that myself and enough friends who were, you know, still pretty, you know, uh, snappy in that kind of fun way, <laughs> that camp way. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so anyway, that's that's how I found I, that's how Patrick got his groove back on, on fierce being coached wow. by a straight man. So it's interesting. You mentioned um, that's a great story. And to your point. He is blunt, right? So he came right yeah. out with it. But oh yeah. But it's funny. He was kind of the main controller. You know, he ran the show at Seinfeld. So it's interesting going hopping back to your Seinfeld experience. He he really wasn't that involved. It sounds like Spike Ferriston and I guess Andy Ackerman and maybe it was Jerry kind of involved a lot more. What do you remember about kind of who was kind of running the show? 
It was very professional. I mean, the, the the typical rule of thumb is you let the director give the actor the notes. If the producers have notes for the actor, they give them to the director who give, then gives them to you. Um, you know, sometimes those lines blur, especially when you're, you know, between takes and they're trying to find something, their brain trust is together. So they're all at you going like, uh, you know, maybe if you speed this up or let's cut this line, then it's everyone together. But usually you're getting that stuff uh, straight from the director. And so uh, Larry wasn't, given me anything uh jerry just when we did our scenes he just smiled at me like i don't know like he found some woodland creature that he thought was hilarious or something which was very flattering you know that he was so uh he, he seemed to really like what i was doing um so that was fun he was obviously a great scene partner um, yeah the, 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 i was just gonna get to that scene the the champagne coolies on the at the cafe <laughs> uh, great scene with kramer there kramer gets along with everyone he's got the sunglasses on um and, and jerry's there you know sharing the champagne coolies it's just yeah. it's such a fun scene and everyone seems you know elaine elaine Wall julie's there as well so you're kind of there with the whole cast um or you've at least yeah. you know at some point worked with all of them but um just wanted to get your thoughts on, on kind of how fun that was i know you said there wasn't an audience for those for those shots but um um, you know, working with Michael Richards across to Michael Richards as he does his thing with the Technicolor dream coat and everything else. I mean, he's so, you know, he he could pull off anything. So I would yeah. imagine that was kind of fun for you to, to kind of bounce things off him. Um, it was fun. And I actually I've told this before. So this isn't an exclusive. It's not a breaking story, but um, it's my Michael Richards story. And basically um, we had to shoot that scene over two days because it started raining halfway through the shoot on the first day. And I don't remember if this happened on first or second day of the shoot for the uh, the Joe Allen's champagne coolie scene, but I'm sitting there at the table, right. In wardrobe camera ready. They're setting up cameras. They're getting these big silk panels in the air to keep, you know, the, uh, uh, light from glaring on us. Um, and, uh, and Jerry's not there yet. He's, you know, wherever he is. And, uh, Michael comes over and introduces himself. And I'm like, hi, nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, that's fun. And then he looks down at the napkins that the art direction or props department had put down on the tablecloth. He went, are these the napkins? And I'm like, I, yeah, I guess. He goes, oh, same color as my shirt. No, no, no. And he grabs like four setups off of the table and sticks them in his pocket and walks away. And I'm like, um, okay. First, I'm thinking like, why does it matching your shirt have anything to do with anything? Right. Maybe he's a, got a little synesthesia and that makes a sound in his, I don't know. But um, anyway, uh, then the art director or set dresser comes up and goes, weren't there napkins here? And I went, yes, there were. And he goes, what happened? And I thought, am I being punked? Are they messing with me? <laughs> I still don't know. And I went, um, <laughs> Mr. Richards took them away. And I feel like I'm telling, like I'm tattling, like I'm snitching. Right. And he goes, why? And I went, um, they apparently match his shirt. And I'm thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm either going to get fired or, you know, this is a big joke they're playing on me or something like that. So the, uh, um, the art director comes back and I don't remember cause I'm a little colorblind if, if, you know, we got the same color napkins or he acquiesced to Michael Richards request or whatever, but it was just the weirdest thing. You know, you're a guest star, you're a little excited, maybe a little nervous and stuff like that. Uh, and then the star comes, does something to you, you know, does something in your area. And, you know, the crew who have a hard ass job, you know, and when they take something off the box, they're done, they're moving on. And they're coming up almost looking at me like, right. like what did you do? Why didn't you stop him? I felt like right. it was going to be the next thing they said. <laughs> wow. That is wild. <laughs> it's weird. very similar. I mean, for, for our fans who, who are just Seinfeld, uh, you know, kind of history. Uh, when they do the show within the show uh, during yeah. Seinfeld, they like do how they came up with the show. The character playing Kramer uh, takes raisins during the audition. He, there's raisins at the table and he just walks through with these raisins. That's a whole thing with George. Why would you take the raisins? And it's just made me think of that. When you're talking about Kramer, you know, Michael Richards taking these napkins and kind of, uh, you know, not telling anyone. And you were there yeah. to see it. It's, it's, that's, that's I, really I don't know funny. if he was in character or that was him or he was just kind of blending into getting, you know, getting his Kramer uh, in gear, so to speak, or what it was, but you know, it made me laugh. <laughs> the the mystery of the napkins. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, so you said that scene specifically took two days because of, of weather. Yeah. We were, yes, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, we were, you know, in, in, in probably the middle of shooting it and, um, hadn't gotten everything. 
And then the fine mist that had been dropping turned into bigger droplets and they called it. And so I had to come back like a week later or something, oh, wow. which is great for, you know, um, a day player guest star because you get paid more. So. Oh, beautiful. Um, yes, ching. Yeah, I mean, listen, it was really a fun episode and you were the, the title character, but kind of a lot of like we mentioned, Michael McDonald was on the show. Um, Heidi, Heidi uh, Swedberg, Susan, yeah. a lot of great guest stars, a lot of fun things going on. Jiffy Park. So were you, but a lot of that wasn't done on set. Like your scene, Jiffy Park was was off. Location. Um, a location, yeah. Elaine with um, the boyfriend with the long hair at the department store. That was probably, so were you, were you on set for all that? Like, did you kind of meet some of these other guest stars? Would love to hear about kind of that experience. Uh, yeah, with the other you know, um, I met the, um, the, the clothes sales guy uh, because that set was on, you know, on the soundstage with uh, Susan's apartment. And so he, they were shooting their scenes in front of an audience the same night I was. Uh, certainly all the Jiffy Park stuff, you know, that was God knows where. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and, I think I'd, I'd read the whole script, obviously, but um, had no idea who was out shooting what, where, and how it was going to really piece together, honestly. Yeah. Uh, were you at the Groundlings at the same time as, as Mike McDonald? Like, were you, were you, did you, were you friendly you with him? Or did you, yeah, you I, was still, there, okay. I was there before him. So, okay. um, but when he was in the Sunday company, which is kind of the junior team, the farm team over there, mm -hmm. Uh, I directed it for a couple months. So I got to direct a cast. Oh my God, they were so talented. It, you know, it was him and Jennifer Joyce and Mary Shear and, and, and so many great people. And, um, and then he got into the main company of the Groundlings. So we had about a year or two where we were doing shows together. Were you aware that he had, you know, been cast in, in Sypha when you, when you were like, did that just kind of work itself out that you guys then knew each uh other and were in that scene together? I think when the script was delivered, like they used to before email, um, you know, and you, you get the script the night before the read through and it had the cast list. And often some of those smaller roles will say TBA or something like that. But I think right. I saw that, oh shit, Mike's going to be there. Great. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, his scene, I don't even know. We, we were kind of discussing it before, before you came on and I, we're not sure what it means. Maybe, I mean, is it something that made sense to you when he says the slide at club USA, it's intense. Like, <laughs> What when he's like talking to you and he's like, oh, if you guys had a slide at Club USA, it's intense. And that was like his way of almost like asking you out, I guess. I don't know. I just never really understood that, to be honest with you. I just again, thought once, was... once again, and this can be seen in some of my dramatic work. Sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't I don't know if Mike had a backstory for that. All I knew is that like, it was like, oh, OK, all right. Um, you know, maybe it was like a weird white party Gay reference? I don't know. I'm not from, <laughs> I'm not from your planet, so I, I can't keep up with this. I'm passing for human most of the time. So, um, yeah, I, I remember the line and I remember, like, you know, being faux impressed with it. But but having a, a true context. No, today I would actually Google it. If I got the script and anything I didn't know, I'd Google. But I uh, don't think we had that then. No, yeah. not 96. Maybe, maybe Yahoo, maybe. I don't know. Ask Jeeves. Um, Ask Jeeves, yeah. A little info seek action. Uh, we can go, go on and on. So, yeah, that, so that scene, actually the whole, you kind of work with a lot of people. Like, it's rare that a guest star kind of works or has scenes with all four. But you had that scene with George, obviously. Kramer, Lunch, and then Jerry and Elaine both come by. Um, yeah. What do you can just like the vibe on the set? Like Tony mentioned this earlier, it was, it was Larry Davis last year. It's it's really interesting that he kind of wasn't too involved in this episode, which which was well, he might have been. He might have been in other areas. He might have been highly involved. Sure. I just, didn't, I just yeah, didn't get sure. any direct, uh, you know, feedback or direction um, or changes or anything from him in 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 my scenes. Gotcha. That's fair. And you're such a professional who you don't need any help, but maybe he did think oh, that yeah. because of your, your ground leaves experience. But um, what do you, I mean, what do you remember just the scenes with Jerry, you mentioned it. I mean, the coolie and just how he turns to you and, you know, yeah. how, how can you ask him out in front of me? What do you, I mean, you can't not laugh during those, those scenes. I mean, how'd you kind of, you have to. how'd you, <laughs> you how'd you hold it together? To. 
So, you know, my inner life during that scene is like, I'm not thinking this is a date in any way, shape or form at <laughs> all. I don't even think the Wigmaster is sexual, frankly. Um, and <laughs> probably was still a virgin and happy to be so. Um, and and uh, so when Jerry is spinning a little bit there, I think it's a little perplexing. And like, I, I just played like, I didn't quite get like, well, he's being a little bit weird right now, isn't he? And I also knew that my job in the story was to be this, um, you know, essentially a plot device for him mm. to up the stakes on how he gets ignored with people. Right. Oh my God. Right. Even, you know, even gay people think that I'm not with someone, you know? Right. Um, so I just, you know, I had to be just oblivious basically. Yeah. And, and you um, <clears throat> Yeah, it's interesting, too, because that's a good that's a good point, because they, they kind of that, the point of that was, like you said, to up the ante on the plot. Right. So he got mistaken with Elaine and it wasn't because the guy thought he wasn't with her because maybe he was gay because then they did the next one. And they said they showed him with. Wait, what is it now? Jerry? Now, wait, wait, now, why? Why am I keeping mistaken both ways? Right. So they had to add that to kind of add that plot. But um you know, it, it's we did some research before this, and it is just we read this, and you maybe you'll remember, maybe you won't, but there's there's something here where it says, um, the line you say when you're talking to Jerry is, "How can you love a guy like that? He's a mess," and you're kind of uh, saying like, I, "I don't see those two together." But you never say George's name, right? And you, it kind of implied probably you're talking about George, but from what yeah. we read, perhaps George was supposed to be said and, and you left it out and they just kept it in. Do you remember any of this happening or anything with the script like that? I've been asked this before. Yeah, it's by why I've, we read. About Honestly, it. I don't remember, but knowing me, I paraphrased. Yeah. And left it out. And they decided they liked it. So they didn't go back and have me do a pickup and do it right. That's all. Or they didn't catch it at the time and then later went holy crap although you know script supervisor would have totally caught that so um i don't believe that um god maybe i've got the script somewhere i need to dig that out um but i but it, it just it sounds a little bit more to me like a patrick bristow mistake um than than any yeah, kind I of think it makes sense either way. Like, I'm not sure it even had to be like you're talking about George, right? He could have been. And even if you were at that point, I, I, I think I, I think the implication is that you're kind of an outsider. You're living with them. And there's also this subplot with George trying to break up with with Susan, sort of when she says, I can't trust you in, yeah. in that episode. And he's like, oh, OK, if you can't trust me, we should just break up. So maybe that had something to do with why we're kind of adding on to that of like maybe they shouldn't be together or something like this. They, they kind of were trying to break them up the entire season right. seven, if you will, until she finally, yeah. you know, they ultimately <laughs> end it but in that odd way but um yeah so eh, I, was, I, thought I, I'd ask I think something. subconsciously I, I might have also not said his name because in my backstory you know she and i had known each other since college i've been through tons of her boyfriends you know good bad and and different and in different and, and just you know even though they were you know married i i think i had to be a little bit not snarky dismissive of him but just i don't really take him too seriously because if my, my character couldn't catch on that really that he didn't like me, you know, because right. also then you might feel bad for my character, which then makes, you know, George look like an asshole. So hence the, you know, the kind of just like, yeah, don't, don't really, uh, don't think much of him. <laughs> <laughs> now, Patrick, you didn't watch much Seinfeld, but did you do any, um, any studying up on Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat? I'm a gay guy born in 1962. I didn't need to do research on that. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? Um, well, they're, I, they're, making a, they're, they're making a comeback. Uh, they're touring in the UK this year. Oh, good for them. Uh, <laughs> have you seen the show? Have you ever seen the show? No. Uh, it's much I think beloved. I've seen bits and pieces of it. but It's much beloved, time. but I just, I can't. I can't with a lot of musical theater anymore, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I saw, I saw productions that friends were in and, you know, and they were fabulous and everything like that, but whew, yeah, it, it's one of those ones where I'm like, yeah, they're, they're still doing that. Huh? Why? It's like, 
to me, it's like little Abner. It's like, you know, you don't, you don't need to do that show ever again. It's done. Yeah. I mean, listen, isn't cat cats is still going on. Who know? I don't know. Um, yeah. So you mentioned 1962. All right. So <laughs> we love to hear how kind of you got in the business. I know you started with the groundlings in 89, but what, I know you grew up in LA, but mm-hmm. how'd you first get kind of introduced into the kind of theater and then television and film? We'd love to kind of hear a little bit of, of your background and what inspired well, you. My parents uh, met in theater school. They were uh, actors in Los Angeles in the mid late forties, um, stage actors. Although my dad did a couple little things in film, which I've been able to find on eBay, which is hilarious to hear wow. him talk like this, you know, like he's caught in yeah. 1946. Um, so I grew up, you know, with their scrapbooks and stuff like that. And I knew that I wanted to do that. So they let me do school plays and things. Um, Growing up in L.A., being a little red haired kid during the era of the Waltons, we'd get approached at Sears by an agent who'd say, like, you know, your kid should be in commercials. And my parents were like, absolutely not. And I later in life, I thank them for that because it's a it's a hard thing to put kids through. They learn too many adult <laughs> dynamics and head games and stuff like that. It, right. it wouldn't be good for me. Yeah, Bowie, let's good. stop that. Bowie. Um so uh, anyway, um, then in college, I declared theater as a major and uh, did that and um, did musicals and little plays here and there and everything in my early 20s. Mid 20s, I started studying at the Groundlings and it was like I'd landed somewhere where I finally fit in. I was like, ah, this is the better use of my skills than trying you know, to be something I wasn't. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I blessed the day I went. And here's Bowie. Is that, I'm assuming David Bowie named after. Yeah, I'm he's assuming? got two different color eyes. He's our friend's dog. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you what your favorite Bowie song was. I thought maybe uh, that was a you know. Oh, ground control to Major Tom. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, yeah. So, did I finish that before I got interrupted by the demanding dog? Yeah, I mean that. That's yeah. That's that seems like uh, plausible. I, mean, I, I think you're right though about not getting started when you're when you're a kid. I think that's the right move. I think they made the right call there. Um, yeah. You see it too many times where it, it just it doesn't like you said. It, it's it's an adult world that maybe they shouldn't be involved in. Um, yeah, I think a kid, especially when they're part of carrying a show and everyone's jobs around them. Yeah, which was a lot kid. of the 80s. I mean, when we were growing up, those were the shows that were the big shows. Yeah. So yeah, that seemed to be. <laughs> That's a lot to put on a kid. Yeah. And I think I think they're not all of them. Some do really well, obviously. But I mm. think there's an opportunity for kids to get really decalibrated in terms of what is reality. When, yeah. you know, they're just being gushed over all the time and everything. It's like this is not reality. Right, right. Speaking um, of, well, not really not the best segue, but uh you're you're the 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 puppet shows that you were doing with the Hensons. Um, yeah. well, could you touch on that a little bit? We were sure, doing that. We were kind of we were trying to do a little bit of research on it, but I was just curious. Is it sound like it's an adult themed uh, Muppets, right? Obviously, but uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that too sure. as well. We'd love to hear about it. Um, well, uh, we don't we don't call them Muppets because Muppets are owned by Disney. These are but these are Jim Henson Company puppets. Uh, we, we branded them as the miscreants some years back and they're a collection of puppets some of which were built for our show some uh were culled from other shows in the past um and so we have this great like we have 80 puppets all in different visual vocabulary some look realistic some look cartoonish and it's a crazy ass stable of puppets then we have six puppeteer improvisers they have to be good enough puppeteers that the Henson company will put them out on stage representing. And they have to be really strong improvisers because to improvise while puppeteering to a Henson acceptable level is no easy feat. The way it started was Brian Henson, Jim's son, um, through his, uh, his wife, Mia Sarah, brought me in to teach uh, improv to the puppeteers because he thought it would be a good skill for them to have. Um, they took to it like ducks to water. We had a great time six weeks into the, the, the course when I was supposed to end. He said, do you want to keep doing that? I said, yeah, I do. And, um, and so I made adjustments that were necessary in the improv approach and technique for the demands of the puppeteers. Um, Cause there are certain things they cannot do that fleshy as we call them improvisers can. And uh, we, we did a little demonstration on the lot 
invited like, you know, I think Brian invited like 200 people, including industry. And I'm like, I was thinking it was going to be brown bag lunches, you know, like <laughs> in the parking lot. Uh, but we got invited to the Aspen Comedy Festival, then to the Edinburgh Festival, then to Australia. And it just took off from there. And it's had many iterations, many cast members. Um, we've performed, you know, almost all over the world. And uh, we continue to. In fact, a couple of weeks here, we are starting our residence at Not Scary Farm during their haunt. And we'll do three kind of half hour mini shows a night. Uh, in their beautiful theater there. And um, it's really fun. I am see it. So I'm the, the bridge between the audience and the, and, and the puppeteers. And uh, it's, it's always kind of like anything can happen night. So I love it. Very cool. Wow. <clears throat> really cool. I think that should be your next collaboration with Larry David, do a little Seinfeld puppeteers and, you know, they came out with a Lego <laughs> set. Why not do a Seinfeld puppets? It makes sense. Wow. You know, yeah. <laughs> So, Pat, uh, we always ask guest stars. They always have fun. They always get invited to the rap parties. Did you? What do you remember about the season seven rap party? Were you invited? Did you go? If I was invited, I didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I was invited. No, you definitely were. You probably. I don't think I was. Did, I mean, was there a season seven rap party other than just like you know, it's the the, the last episode and they they bring in pizza? I don't know. If they, if oh no, a, they. they they, yeah, they've they done go, bowling. You know. They've been over at the observatory. They've done a few. We've heard a few stories here and there <clears> from. Uh, well, one of two things was happening. Either I was working on something else, which is possible back then, especially, um, or uh, my invitation must have gotten lost in the mail. One of the two. <laughs> or my, yeah, maybe or my, agent, my agent at the time stole it and went and represented me. You know, because <laughs> of the post Yeah, you're you're bit you're busy with Ellen during those years for sure. Um, well, Patrick, this was great, man. I mean, uh, we can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for taking a trip down memory lane. The wig master who could ever forget it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for remembering and thanks for having me and Bowie, the dog and Irene, the squawking parrot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very so professional. Much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. Thank Bye. Thanks. Bye. Cheers.